enjoy as Taipusum across the country. Batupute RCI will uncover the truth. Salam Malaysia Madani, I'm Olivia Nicholas and you're watching Malaysia Tonight. The Taipusum celebration observed by Hindu devotees today was joyously celebrated in a harmonious atmosphere throughout the country. The festivity was felt at the Sri Subramania Swami Temple in Batu Caves where a sea of Hindu devotees flooded the temple as early as 8 a.m. to fulfill their vows. Digital Minister Gobind Singh Dio was also at the temple for the Thai Pusim celebration, which falls in the month of Thai, the 10th month in the Tamil calendar. Gobind told reporters that over 2 million visitors, both Malaysians and international tourists, joined in the celebrations today. In Para, Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Law and Institutional Reforms M. Kula Segrin was among the thousands of Hindu devotees who flooded the Kalumalai Arul Migu Sri Subramania Temple in Gudong Chiro, Ipoh, since early morning. According to Para Deputy Police Chief Dato Azizi Ma'ariz, an estimated 350,000 visitors, including Hindu devotees, are expected at the temple from yesterday until tomorrow. In Negri Similan, the mood at the Sri Bala Tanda Yutapani temple in Surumban was also lively with the presence of nearly 6,000 Hindu devotees at the temple. Temple President R. Paramis Warren said the temple is the main focal point for the state's 15% Hindu population to celebrate the religious event. Hindu devotees arrived as early as 6.30 a.m. at the temple and a procession around the city of Surumban also took place at 7 p.m. The move to establish the Royal Commission of Inquiry, RCI, to review the issue of Malaysia's sovereignty over Batu Pute, Batuan Tengah and Tuber Selatan will facilitate additional investigations to uncover the truth behind the issue. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Law and Institutional Reform, Datuk Sri Azlina of Mansaid, noted the establishment of the RCI will also assist the government in processes and procedures related to national sovereignty. Tato Sri Azalina said the RCI will also assist the government in determining the agency responsible for matters involving sovereignty. She said that although the Special Task Force on Batu Bute had concluded its report, the matter is still subject to the Official Secrets Act and had not been made public. Kedaulatan tidak boleh decided by just one person saja. Issue kedaulatan, there cannot be a mistake on kedaulatan. What happened in Sulu is something that kita kena belajar. We cannot have a mistake on sovereignty. And sovereignty is about border, is about island. Sovereignty is about a lot of things. She said this to reporters after launching the Justice on Wheels WAN at Dewan Gawir Kampung Madzian in Penampang today. She added she will be tabling the state immunity bill in the next parliament session to safeguard Malaysia's sovereignty from being challenged. Yesterday during the cabinet meeting, an agreement was reached to establish an RCI task with examining the management of issues related to the sovereignty of Batu Puteh, Batu Antenga and Tuber Selatan. Lembaga Tabung Haji TH refuted allegations that it distributed certain quotas to private parties or registered Hajj pilgrimage operators, PJH. TH said the Hajj quota of 31,600 allotted by the Saudi Arabian government is according to the Open Hajj registration system based on a first-come, first-served basis implemented since 1995. TH said once prospective pilgrims have been selected in the annual quota, they can choose whether they want to perform the Kaj through TH Muasasa or through PJH companies, which TH has licensed. Prospective pilgrims who choose the PJH companies are those who can pay more than the cost of pilgrimage to get better services for Muasasa. TH also said the claims that the agency only handles 11,000 pilgrims this year are not true because the majority of pilgrims, or around 70 to 80, 
60 percent, will be performing Hajj to Muasasa. It added the PJH companies made payments to TH for each of their congregations for services and facilities in the Holy Land, including the mandatory payments imposed by Saudi Arabia. TH advised the public not to easily believe in fake news circulating on their social media and prospective pilgrims are advised to refer to TH official social media platform to obtain authentic, accurate and up-to-date information. The Commercial Crimes Investigation Department, CCID, anticipates a surge in police reports linked to artificial intelligence technology, AI, due to its prevalence in Malaysia and globally. CCID Director Dato Sri Ramli Mohamed Yusuf cites a rapid AI development as a concern as it could be misused for disinformation and misinformation. He mentioned that the rise in police reports is expected to escalate annually given that the utilization of AI can contribute to crimes such as cryptocurrency fraud, Macau scams, ransomware and investment fraud. Speaking to Bernama, Dato Sri Ramli said CCID needs to be a few steps ahead in tackling AI-related scams, adding the department has plans to use AI technology in stages for investigations. Commenting on the case involving the impersonation of a friend on Telegram and WhatsApp, he stated that CCID had identified a syndicate used by criminals for fraudulent activities. The investigation revealed that the syndicate hacked into victims' Telegram or WhatsApp accounts reaching out to contacts in the victim's friends list to request money. To prevent fraud, the CCID director advised the public to be cautious when receiving money loan messages. He suggests it is wiser to verify the information by contacting the sender beforehand, as these cases can be challenging to detect once the transaction goes through. Next, Sabah to reduce hardcore poverty by up to 80% this year. The Sabah government aims to reduce the rate of hardcore poverty by at least 70 to 80 percent in the state by the end of this year. Chief Minister Dato Sri Hajiji Noor said a total of 22,510 household heads have been categorized as hardcore poor in the ECASI system so far. He said the Sabah government is confident that the target to reduce the rate of hardcore poverty in the state is achievable through several initiatives that have been introduced, including providing business capital aid and Sabah Majujaya, SMJ affordable homes to the affected groups. Inshallah, dalam tahun ini atau mungkin tahun depan dengan inisiatif ini kita boleh kurangkan at least 70 80 persen kita bagi peluang pekerjaan kita bagi bantuan semuanya sasaran kita kalau boleh semua kita kasih peluang kerja dan juga berniaga dan juga bantuan dari daripada kerajaan kewangan the chief minister said this when met by reporters after handing over the aid agency's participation letter for the pilot program to reduce the rate of hardcore poverty in Tuaran and the appointment of SMJ Kerja Initiative workers today. In addition to channeling cash aid to the targeted group, Dato Sri Hajiji said the Sabah government views efforts to provide employment opportunities for children from hardcore poor families as one of the holistic methods to help them get out of the shackles of poverty. The decision by Bagnagara Malaysia's BNM Monetary Policy Committee, MPC, to maintain the overnight policy rate OPR at 3% will stimulate economic growth and ensure that the gross domestic product target this year is achievable. Economic analyst Associate Professor Dr. Irwan Shah Zainal Abidin is of the view that the decision was taken after taking into consideration the inflation and assessment and the prospects of domestic and global economic growth. Ini penting untuk kita mengambil kira terutamanya keputusan-keputusan uh, terhadap uh, OPR ini uh, di masa hadapan supaya kita akan memastikan bahawa momentum pertumbuhan ekonomi bukan saja dapat dikekalkan tetapi dapat ditingkatkan uh, untuk memastikan bahawa kita mempunyai usaha untuk uh, mencipta lagi banyak peluang pekerjaan 
dan juga meningkatkan aktiviti pelaburan dan perniagaan di negara kita. Meanwhile, Sabah University Technology Mara Senior Lecturer and Political Economist Associate Professor Dr. Fridausi Sufian said the current OPR rate, which has been maintained since May last year, has managed to reduce inflation while reflecting BNM's credibility in handling the matter. Dengan kadar tiga peratus ini sudah tentu saya percaya dapat uh, menyokong perbelanjaan dan juga pelaburan sektor swasta dan juga awam walaupun kita akui bahawa memang keadaan ekonomi global ini masih lagi agak mencabar ketika ini ya. Jadi mengekalkan 3% ini sudah tentu dapat menyokong agenda pertumbuhan uh, ekonomi negara dengan plan-plan yang kita ada dan telah diperkenalkan oleh Malaysia Debt Ventures Berhad MDV is targeting to disburse 700 million ringgit in financing to 50 companies this year with a focus on technology. Its Chief Business Officer Mara Zizi Omar said the increase in financing from 600 ringgit last year is in line with its financing expansion to companies from a new sector. This includes companies involved in green technology, waste to energy and startup. Ada juga di mana orang um, menjangkakan kita hanya membiaya syarikat-syarikat yang dimiliki oleh uh, orang Malaysia saja uh, uh, itu tidak juga kerana kita juga membenarkan peluang uh, uh, apa nak collaboration ataupun partnership uh, ada keperluan di antara teknologi dibawa masuk uh, kepandaian ataupun um, expertise dibawa masuk untuk membangunkan ataupun membangunkan satu teknologi baru uh, di, di di Malaysia ini. MDV, a unit under the Finance Ministry, was established by the government in 2002 to provide flexible and innovative financing facilities to develop the information and communications technology ICT sector that has been identified and prioritized by the government as a catalyst for the nation's growth. To date, MDV has disbursed 13.40 billion ringgit in financing, benefiting 1,094 companies. United Overseas Bank Malaysia Berhad or UOB Malaysia has established its inaugural 5 billion Islamic debt program under the Sharia principle of Wakala bi al Istimar. In a statement today, the bank said during the book building exercise, the Islamic debt offering received an overwhelming response from the market and was oversubscribed by approximately 3.39 times. The bank also shared that a diverse group of 42 high-quality investors, including insurance companies, fund managers, government-linked investment companies, banks and private banks, subscribed to the offering. Its chief executive officer, Ng Wei Wei, said the oversubscription reflects investors' confidence in UOB Malaysia's solid financial position. The Tier 2 Sukuk Wakala received an AA1 rating by Ram Rating Services, Burhad underscore in UOB Malaysia's robust credit profile. The issuance is scheduled on the 8th of February and is intended to qualify as UOB Malaysia's Tier 2 capital on a consolidated basis, adhering to Bank Negara Malaysia's capital adequacies framework for Islamic banks. Malaysia and UAE have strengthened their commitment on advancing investment cooperation in the digital infrastructure sector. Both parties have signed a memorandum of understanding today marking a strategic partnership on the development of data centres in Malaysia with potential projects anticipated to achieve a total capacity of 500 megawatts. The MOU was signed by Investment, Trade and Industry Minister Tunku Datuk Sri Zafrul Abdulaziz and UA Investment Minister Mohammed Hassan Al Suwaidi. Miti in a statement today said that the MOU represents a strong commitment towards robust collaboration on the exchange of knowledge and expertise in the digital infrastructure sector between Malaysia and the UAE. It also aimed at fostering greater bilateral economic and investment relationships between between the public and private sector of both countries. Currently, the UAE is Malaysia's second largest trading partner in the Middle East and Malaysia is a key player in UAE's exports and re-exports in the Asian region. 
Tanaga National Burhat TNB is spearheading a transformative partnership with China's state-owned power utilities aimed at revolutionizing the Asian power grid through cutting-edge high-voltage direct current HVDC technology. This strategic move underscores TNB's commitment as a regional energy leader dedicated to advancing sustainable energy solutions. President and Chief Executive Officer Dato Sri Baharin Din noted the pivotal role of HVDC technology in fostering efficient power trading, seamless resource sharing and the integration of renewable energy sources among Asian nations. He said TNB is at the forefront of pioneering sustainable energy initiatives in the Asian region and its exploration of HVDC technology is a testament to the company's commitment to innovation and sustainability. Dato Sri Baharin further explained that the potential partnership with China's state-owned utilities on HVDC projects is strategically designed to capitalize on their expertise and experience in developing complex HVDC projects projects in China and globally. This, he added, signifies a milestone in TNB's growth and a testament to the company's dedication in pushing the boundaries of sustainability and technological innovation. Boeing began a delivery of its first 737 MAX to a Chinese airline on Wednesday, ending a four-year freeze on imports of the U.S. plane, plane maker's most profitable product in a respite for severely strained trade relations between the world's two largest economies. Flight data from Flight Radar 24 shows a 737 MAX 8 for China's Southern Airlines departed from Satellite Boeing Field in Washington State at 11.55 a.m. and landed in Honolulu. It will then leave for its final destination in China. For Boeing, the delivery symbolizes the reopening of doors to China, one of the fastest growing aerospace markets, which Boeing projects will compose 20% of the world's aircraft demand through 2042. China's central bank announced measures that would help boost the liquidity available to property developers. The move will ease a lingering cash crunch for Chinese developers that have been at the receiving end of Beijing's crackdown aimed at addressing the property sector's bloated debt levels. The People's Bank of China and the Ministry of Finance said that the new measures will be valid until the end of this year. Banks can now issue loans to commercial real estate firms with good comprehensive benefits that have passed the completion inspection and acceptance, obtained the real estate ownership certificate and been put into operation with the operating property as collateral. China's property crisis could take years to resolve, with Oxford Economics estimating at least four to six years for real estate development in the country to complete unfinished residential properties. Some of the China's largest property developers face serious debt problems, with some of its largest players having filed for bankruptcy. China's real estate troubles are closely linked with local government finances, since they have typically relied on land sales to developers for a significant portion of their revenue. The U.S. economy likely grew at its slowest pace in one and a half years in the fourth quarter last year as businesses throttled back on inventory investment and consumer spending cooled a bit. The pace, however, was probably enough to have kept a recession at bay in 2023. The Commerce Department's advanced fourth quarter gross domestic product report, which is also expected to show inflation moderating last quarter, will reinforce expectations that the Federal Reserve will start cutting interest rates sometime in the first half of this year. According to Reuters' survey of economists, GDP likely increased at a 2% annualized rate last quarter.
That would be the slowest since the second quarter of 2022 and follows a 4.9% pace of acceleration in the July-September quarter. Growth for the full year is expected to come in at about 2.5%, picking up from the 1.9% notched in 2022. Economies had largely based their gloomy forecast on the rapid pace at which the Fed was raising rates to dampen demand. Most have walked back their recession calls and now expect slow growth this year before an acceleration in 2025 as the effects of anticipated rate cuts kick in. Still ahead, humanitarians struggling to provide aid in Gaza. Nine people were killed and 75 injured on Wednesday in a direct hit on a training centre turned shelter in southern Gaza run by a UN agency that assists Palestinian UNRWA. The compound was clearly marked a UN facility and its coordinates were shared with Israeli authorities as they always do for all the facilities according to UN officials on the ground. The incident was indicative of the recent intense fighting around Khan Yunis, according to Jamie McGoldrick, interim UN humanitarian coordinator for the occupied Palestinian territory. Briefing reporters via video conference, he said humanitarians are struggling to provide displaced people with basic services such as food, medical support, shelter, water and sanitation. The shock is actually starting to wane now and people start to see themselves a resignation that this is this is what they're going to have to face for some significant time. And we in the international, the UN family and its partners are trying the best we can to get through, but we are faced with massive challenges. Many of them are outside our, our control. He noted that humanitarian agencies are bringing 250 trucks a day into Gaza on a good day through the Rafah crossing, where in the past there would normally be about 500 trucks per day from the private sector bringing in basic commodities. He said an extra burden will be relying on bringing in fresh produce as there would not be very much farming again for a significant part of time. The International Court of Justice, ICJ, will deliver on Friday its decision on the request for the indication of provisional measures submitted by South Africa. This pertains to this case involving the application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in the Gaza Strip, South Africa versus Israel, as stated in the press release by the court. A public sitting will take place at 1 p.m. at the Peace Palace in The Hague, Netherlands, during which the President of the Court will read the Court's order. South Africa's Foreign Minister Naledi Pandor is flying to The Hague on Friday when the ICJ delivers his highly anticipated verdict on South Africa's request for an interim ruling in its genocide case against Israel. The ruling, if granted, would probably take the form of an order to Israel to announce a ceasefire in Gaza and allow more UN humanitarian aid into the country. On 29th of December last year, South Africa filed a case against Israel, accused Using it of genocidal acts in its aggression on Gaza. A two-day public hearing on South Africa's genocide case against Israel was held on the 11th of January. Coming up in sports, injury may see Shafi Dawes miss out on collecting Olympic points. Stay with us. 
National track cyclist Muhammad Shah Fidal Sharum may have to skip the 2024 UCI Track Nations Cup after suffering injuries following an accident while undergoing training at the National Velodrome in Nilai on Tuesday. Muhammad Shah Fidal said he was supposed to leave for Australia on Saturday but is still waiting for the coaches to decide whether he will be allowed to compete in the 2nd and 4th of February meet in Adelaide. If forced to skip the Nations Cup, the rider nicknamed the Terminator Shah will miss the chance to add more points for the 2024 Paris Olympics. Speaking of the accident he was involved in, the 28-year-old said he was trying to chase after the motorcycle in front of him when the bicycle he was riding had a burst tyre. He injured his left shoulder and left thigh and has a swollen ankle, making it difficult for him to even walk. The 2024 Paris Olympics qualifying period for track cycling began began on the 19th of July last year and will end on the 14th of April. For the record, Mohamed Shafri Dao's clinched silver in men's Kirin at the UCI Track Nations Cup in Cairo, Egypt last March, before bagging silver in the same event at the International Belgian Track Meet in Ghent last April. He also won bronze in the sprint and Kirin events at the 2022 Hangzhou ASEAN. Japan beat Indonesia 3-1 in their final Asian Cup Group D game on Wednesday to guarantee a top two finish and qualify for the last 16 while Iraq went top with maximum points when they sealed a 3-2 win over Vietnam with a 102nd minute winner. Japan ISA Ueda scored twice for Hajime Moriyasu's side who finished second with six points while Iraq's Ayman Hussein went top of the tournament scoring charts with his fourth and fifth goal. The final striker put the four-time champions in control early on when he opened the scoring in the sixth minute from a penalty kick after he was wrestled to the ground by Indonesian captain Jordi Amat. In the seventh minute of the second half, Yuda found the net once more, capping off an orchestrated team playing, starting with Takihiro Tomiyasu feeding Ritsu Don in the midfield. Don then sprinted through the centre, receiving a well-timed return pass from the Kento Nakamura to set off Yuda with the simplest of finishes at the far post. Indonesian defender Justin Hubner scored an own goal in the 87th minute before his compatriot Sandy Walsh struck at the other end a minute into at a time. The result saw Japan finish three points behind Iraq who emerged as group champions after collecting maximum points by edging Vietnam 3-2 in another match. Indonesia meanwhile took third place and will have to wait for the conclusion of the group phase on Thursday to determine if they will advance to the last 16. Meanwhile, Iraq emerged victoriously in a thrilling encounter against Vietnam at the Justin Bin Hamad Stadium with striker Ahmed Hussein coming off from the bench and scoring a brace to help the Lions of Mesopotamia maintain its winning record in the campaign. Vietnam thought they had secured the lead in the 17th minute when Iraqi defender Zaid Tassin inadvertently netted an own goal while attempting to clear Vo Min's strong cross. However, VAR intervention nullified the goal. The deadlock was eventually broken in the 40th minute when Bua Huang Viet An scored a well-placed volley from Quad Vang Kang, free kick before this golden star warrior faced a setback just before halftime as Quad Vang Kang received a second yellow card, reducing them to 10 players. Eager to capitalize on the advantage, the start of the second half saw an immediate impact as defender Rebin Solaka headed his first international goal from Ali Jazim's corner kick to level the score in the 47th minute. Ahmed Hussein secured Iraq's second goal by heading in a cross from Jasim for his fourth goal on the campaign in the 73rd minute before his spot kick in the 83rd minute was denied by the woodwork. Vietnam, led by Philippe Trozia, managed to equalise in the first minute on stoppage time through substitute Mueng Muang Hai. However, it was heartbreak for the Southeast Asian side when a last-minute penalty conceded by Bo Ming Trong allowed Hussein to secure Iraq's winning goal. That's it from us this evening in our top story, joyous Taipusim across the country. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Happy Taipusim. Thanks for watching.